It is time for another YouTube live stream. Welcome everybody, I'm Zach. I'm a certified public accountant and this is Wolves in Finance. Today, we are talking about the stock market. Stock market warning signs. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but this month has been a really bad month for the stock market. And you know, I watch the news, I watch the business news to see what they're saying. And these people on CNBC and Bloomberg News aren't telling people what's actually going on. So we're gonna cover what's going on with the stock market and some interesting indicators, some economic indicators that you might not have heard about. So lots of cool stuff. This is a packed live stream. We got lots to cover. So we're just gonna sit and chill, grab a drink, have some snacks, and we're gonna talk about the stock market. Welcome to everybody. I see everybody hanging out in the chat. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here. Let's do this. Go ahead and type in chat what state you're watching the live stream from. This will give me kind of an idea of what who's in the audience today. But uh, yeah, let me know where you're where you're watching from. Hello to uh, Frederick and Sassy Lady and Jeffrey, our moderator today. Thank you for showing up. Yeah, uh, let's all be respectful in the chat. If anything gets too out of hand, they can. Uh, my moderators will hide you in chat. Thank you guys for being here. I see lots of people from lots of places. Um, yeah, so just so you know, I read all the chats. So even if it doesn't seem like I'm like reading it while we're on stream, I'm, I'm catching it. And then I go back after the stream and reread everybody's comments. So yeah, uh, even if it seems like I'm not catching your chat, I am. <laughs> I read all the comments. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you for chatting. I see all you guys. Northern New Mexico is here. Virginia's here. Minnesota, South Carolina, Portland, Maine, Long Island, New York. Uh, good to see all of you guys. All right, um, let's just get started here. But to start with, let's get some disclaimers out of the way because we're talking about the stock market and financial stuff. This presentation is for educational purposes only and not financial advice. Investing is risky. I have a little picture here of somebody who's had a bad day on the stock market. Um, it's recommended that you speak with a financial professional before making investment decisions. All right, so what has been happening in the stock market? This is uh, the Dow, and this is the last three months of the Dow. So February, Mar no, February, March, and April. And so you can see this is April right here. This is like going off a cliff. <laughs> this is very depressing to see that's happening this month. Um, those of you who don't know, the Dow is um, 30 companies. It's supposed to be the 30 biggest, best companies in the United States. So um, it's supposed to be a barometer of the economy of the US. And even if you don't trade stocks, it's good to know what's going on in the stock market because it affects your life. I mean, just in terms of making life decisions, it's good to know what's, what's happening here. So the Dow is a good kind of barometer of what's happening in the economy and the stock market. Um, let's move on because we can also look at the S&P 500. So the Dow is 30 companies, S&P 500 is 500 of the best companies in the United States. And this is the same thing last three months. Here we see April. going off a cliff. <laughs> so what is happening? What is happening? Why is this doing this? It's just, it's, it's very depressing to see. I want to show you guys one more quick metric here. This is what's called the VIX. And so this is, this measures, I'll give you the technical definition. This is the 30 day forward projection of price swings, volatility in the S&P 500. So uh, they look at what's happening in the S&P 500 over the next 30 days? Are people buying, selling? And when people are, are buying and selling and prices are going all over the place, the VIX goes up. So people look at the VIX as an indication of fear. When there's a lot of fear in the market, the VIX goes up because people are scrambling, trying to figure out what's going on. 
So here is April here and the chart, and the VIX is going through the roof. Now, just to keep this in context, historically, the VIX can go a lot higher than this. I mean, this isn't like, this isn't like the end of the world here. Uh, like, for instance, during the pandemic, when the economy was tanking, the VIX went, the VIX went way higher than this. So there's a lot higher to go. But this is certainly a bad trend. You don't want to see the VIX doing this. So between stock prices going down, the VIX going up in April, something's going on. So we're going to walk through and try to figure out what that is. Uh, before we jump in to the, to the rest of this, let's do a like spike. You got, we've done this a couple of times. You guys know how to do the like spike. I'm going to cut count down from three. And when I get to one, I want everybody to hit that like button. If you're, if you're enjoying this live stream, let's do it. Three, two, one, like spike, boom, baby. That's what I'm talking about. All right, let's go. Let's keep going here. I love talking about this financial stuff, by the way. I know I've been talking more about like politics lately on my channel, but you know, I'm an accountant, so like I can talk about this stuff forever. <laughs> um, yeah, but this is fun. This is a lot of fun. All right. Um, yeah, we got to talk about the Federal Reserve. So a lot of people are saying that the problems in the stock market are coming from the Federal Reserve. And I'll explain to you why. I actually don't think that's the full story, and I'm going to explain that as well. Uh, but so the Federal Reserve is one piece of it, but I think there's also some other things going on, which I'll get to that no one else is talking about. But what is the Federal Reserve doing? Uh, most of you guys who are watching this know this already, but I'm going to give just a basic overview of the Federal Reserve for people who, who don't know. Uh, the Federal Reserve, their main job is to raise and lower interest rates. So they control something called the Fed funds rate, which is the rate that banks can borrow money from the Fed. So if they raise rates, the Fed funds rate, that's going to raise the rate that banks can borrow their money. What happens is if, the bank, if it costs the banks more money to borrow, to borrow more money, they're going to pass that cost on to you. So it's going to cost you more money to borrow money. And so by raising and lowering this rate, that's how the Federal Reserve controls the whole U.S. economy because it trickles through the whole economy. And so what happens is when they lower the rates, the economy does better. When they raise the rates, the economy does worse. So you, you might say, well, why don't they just always keep the rates low? The problem is if they keep rates low, then inflation goes through the roof. As you all know, we're struggling with inflation right now. So they've been raising the rates to help fight inflation because that helps to fight inflation. But as they raise rates, the economy does worse. So it's this balancing act between making the economy do well, uh, controlling unemployment, and also controlling inflation. So that's what the Fed is, is dealing with. All right. Uh, so let's look at where the Fed funds rate is right now. This is a chart of what the Fed funds rate has been. This goes back to the 60s, okay? This is a big historical chart of what the Fed has been doing with the Fed funds rate. Today, the Fed funds rate is currently at 5.33%. This is the highest it's been in 20 years. <laughs> so here we are, I can show you on my mouse here. This is at the edge of the chart here. This is the 5.33%. So for the last, for a long time, we've had like 0% rates. And that's why the economy feels so bad right now. Because going from 0 to 5% rates is excruciating for people. Now, you have to keep this in context, though. I mean, historically, rates have been a lot higher. Like, if you look over here, this is the 80s, okay? The 80s, the, the lowest the rate... the the lowest rates in the 80s were still higher than the rate is today. So those poor people in the 80s, we really shouldn't, we really shouldn't be complaining today because they had a, a higher rates in the 80s. But still, you know, like what's happening is the rates have been so low for so long and then they suddenly shot up so quickly 
that that's causing a lot of pain. Here's the problem the Fed is in. Inflation is out of control. It's out of control. Inflation is through the roof. So what I mentioned before is if the Fed can't lower the rate with inflation out of control because inflation will get worse. And we can't have inflation getting worse. So, you know, the economy is doing bad, but the Fed is in this really tough spot. They can't raise rates without the economy tanking. They can't lower rates without inflation going through the roof. So the Fed is stuck. And yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a problem. It's a problem. This is Mr. Jerome Powell. So this is the chair of the Federal Reserve. He's the guy who controls everything. He's controlling this rate moving up and down. Now he has a board, he has people who work with him, but this is the guy at the top. The buck stops with him. Now I'm not gonna go too deep into Jerome Powell. I can talk about him for hours. <laughs> if you've watched my channel, you know, I have been pretty critical of Jerome Powell and I'll just boil it down into a nutshell of why I don't like about Jerome Powell. Jerome Powell, uh, and you guys might not know about this, Jerome Powell, before he was head of the Federal Reserve, he used to be an investment banker. That's unusual, okay? Historically, the head of the Federal Reserve is an economist, okay? You want an intellectual person who will sit there and make the tough economic choices that will benefit everybody in America. He's an investment banker. Okay, have you ever met an investment banker? They are all about the money. Investment bankers, their job is to make money for themselves and their friends on Wall Street. And if you look at what Jerome Powell has done, he's acted like an investment banker. As head of the Federal Reserve, he's done a lot of things. You can go through his actions that he's done. He's done a lot of things to benefit his friends on Wall Street while screwing over the American people. And so, you know, that's my criticism of Jerome Powell. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to like go off on a tangent because I want to focus on the stock market. But yeah, that he's the guy. He's the guy who's in charge. Oh, in fact... What, let me know in chat. Are, is there any Jerome Powell fans in chat? I might be, I might be like making some people mad here <laughs> by like ragging on Jerome Powell. <laughs> let me know in chat if you're a fan or not <laughs> of what he's been doing at, at the Fed. All right. Let's talk about what's going on in inflation. I've mentioned this a couple of times. Inflation is out of control. What actually is happening with inflation? So... You can see here, this is a chart of inflation, annual inflation rate since 2019. So this goes back to 2019 to today. Uh, this was in March. So this just, this is really recent data here. And you can see this gray bar here is when the pandemic happened. So we had that recession at the pandemic. And then after the pandemic, inflation spiked. And this is this huge spike. And then, then it started going back down again. And so this is, you can, you, you might've heard people talk about, oh, we're winning the war against inflation. We're taming inflation. This is what they're talking about, that this is going down. This inflation metric is going down. This is what you need to understand. Look over here on the left-hand side of this chart. These are percentages. These are percentage increases in inflation. Okay. <laughs> so even if this is going down, inflation is still going up. It's just not going up as fast as it was over here. So to say that we beat inflation is a little misleading, okay? This is, this is 9% up here at the top. So if it goes from 9% to 7%, that's still really bad. Inflation is still like running away from us, okay? So now look over here. Over here, inflation was like right around 2%. Now you're never gonna get inflation to zero, 
uh, you want inflation to be a healthy inflation rates around 2%. So there was always a little bit of inflation, but it's reasonable. So over here, this was when Donald Trump was president before the pandemic. Inflation was great. It was right around 2%. Biden becomes president. Inflation goes out of control all over the place, then comes back down. And the problem here is it stopped. Jerome Powell in the Federal Reserve wants the inflation to go back down to 2%, which would be down here. But it's not going down there. It stopped. And so this is the current issue is that inflation is sticky. No matter what they do, they can't get inflation to go back down. And then if you look at actually what's happened lately, it's going back up again. And this has really freaked people out because it's going back up again. It could go all the way back up to the top. What is going on here? So this is a prop. This is a big problem. And this is why the Fed is stuck. They cannot lower rates while inflation is not getting better. Okay. So what is the Fed saying about all of this? This is the big quote from this week. This happened on Tuesday. Jerome Powell gave a speech. And you've got to understand, Jerome Powell, in one sentence, he can, he can just speak a sentence and it can affect markets all over the world. <laughs> so this is what he said. He said in a speech that it was going to take longer than expected before rates go back down. So everybody was, gonna, was expecting, people were expecting, oh, inflation's coming back down. That means he can cut rates again. Well, no, no. He gave this speech and said, no, it's going to be longer than you all expect before we cut the rates. And that was the news headline. That headline was on newspapers all over the world. And this is what people are saying is causing the market to crash in April. Now, I don't think that's, the, that's not the whole story. I'm going to tell you what else is happening. But this is part of it. This is part of the story is that people were expecting rates to come, rate cuts, and they're not coming. He said, Jerome Powell said this week, they're not coming. Uh, well, it's going to be longer than expected. So, and this is the longer quote here. He said, we've said at the FOMC, which is the Federal Open Markets Committee, that we'll need greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably towards 2% before it would be appropriate to ease policy. So he is saying this has to go down to 2% before he's going to lower those rates. So... We could be waiting a long time. And that's not good. That is not good. All right. While we're on Jerome Powell, I have to mention, do you guys know someone named James O'Keefe? James O'Keefe, he used to work at Project Veritas, and now he's doing his own thing. He just released a video um, April 10th on his Twitter page of an undercover, he, it's an undercover video that he recorded of this man here. His name is Aurel Hismo. He's a principal economist at the Federal Reserve. So this guy works for Jerome Powell. And if you're interested in the Fed, I'm not going to show his video here because I don't want to take views away from him. But you got to go watch this video. If you're like, if you're interested in the Fed and what's going on, it's it's funny and shocking at the same time. Like. I couldn't believe it. So if you want to find it, it's on his Twitter, his Twitter page um, on April 10th. Um, but yeah, it's this undercover video of him having of, of a conversation with this guy. And just to give you some, some quotes from the video, this guy said, he's talking about Jerome Powell and how they manage the Fed. He said, um, Powell started raising interest rates doing the opposite of what Trump wanted. And then he said he wants to be remembered as someone who held the line against Trump. So he's talking as if the Fed is making decisions not for the benefit of the American people, not for the benefit of the economy, but they're making decisions based on politics. They're making decisions on politics in order to get Trump. I, this is completely unacceptable. Now... I don't know how much we can actually read into this because it, it was a hidden camera. He didn't know he was on camera. I, this isn't like an official statement. So he could have been lying. We don't know if this is true. 
But it was just this really uh, insightful look into how these people think in the Fed. If these are the people, the bureaucrats who are working behind the scenes in the Fed, and they're all hyper-political, and they're using the, the mechanisms at the Fed against the American people, I, that is horrible. That's absolutely horrible. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that uh, great, great video by uh, James O'Keefe. Okay, so that's what's going on in the Fed. I wanted to start there because when, people, when you ask people, why is the stock market doing so bad this month? They'll say it's because of the Fed. It's because of Jerome Powell and this statement. Well, that's not the full story. That's not really what's going on. What's really going on, in my opinion, has to do with commercial real estate. And this is an example. Look at this picture. Look at this building right here, this tall building. This is the former AT&T building. This is in St. Louis. So it looks like this building also has an AT&T logo. So I don't, I don't know the story here. Maybe AT&T moved from this building to this building. I don't know. But we're talking about this building here. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about St. Louis. So if you do, it's, is this right? Did this used to be the AT&T building? I'm not sure. Anyway, what happened is this building recently sold for $3.6 million. The building was worth $205 million in 2006. So if you know anything about real estate prices, it is mind blowing that you can buy this gigantic skyscraper, one of the tallest buildings in St. Louis for only $3.6 million. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? I mean, Small houses in Los Angeles cost $3.6 million. Like what? <laughs> so yeah, this is less than 2% of peak price. And when you see like things like this happening, the economy is in trouble. I, this is a warning sign if I've ever seen one. 2% of your peak price for a property sale? That's outrageous. Like, what is going on? Now, you might just say, Zach, you just found one example. You're blowing this out of proportion. This is just one example. Hold on, you guys. Just, just wait and see what I found. Okay. San Francisco, this building, a 20-story office tower that sold for $146 million a decade ago, was listed in December for just $80 million fraction of the price. Chicago, an office building sold for $90 million in 2004, sold last month, last month for $20 million. And look at this building. This is a nice building. Looks like a nice location, sold for $20 million. Are you guys getting scared? I, I see this information. This is scary. Washington, D.C. This 12-story building sold for $100 million in 2018, recently sold for $36 million, a fraction of the price. And this building is in a good location. This, Washington, D.C., near the White House, selling for a fraction of the price. And so you guys, I mean, you guys know the story. The, the pandemic happened. People started working from home, and a lot of people never went back to the office. A lot of companies have started, you know, they, they ended their leases for their office space. So all these office buildings are just sitting empty, and that's what's happening. We have cities full of empty office buildings. Well, that's a problem because those buildings have mortgages to pay. They have bank loans. So how are they going to pay off their loans if they have no money coming in from rent? Sounds like someone's going to default. And that's a big problem. When you have all these buildings that this is happening to at the same time. I mean, we just went through all across the country. West Coast, East Coast, 
Midwest. This is happening all across America. This reminds me a little bit about the 2008 crash. Do you got put in chat if you remember living through the 2008 real estate crash? The parallels are shocking. It's the same thing. It's the same thing all over again. So this is a photograph of, an, of a typical neighborhood that was the epicenter of the 2008 crash. If you guys remember, I'll just really briefly go over it. Subprime mortgages. People were buying houses with what are called subprime mortgages, which are, which are crummy loans. They couldn't pay off the loans. They foreclosed on all these houses all at the same time. The banks were packaging those loans into financial securities and selling them as AAA securities when they were backed by all these crummy loans. Everything started falling apart. People who had bought these securities that they thought were AAA securities ended up not being AAA securities. And there was insurance backing all of these that failed. Credit default swaps failed. What ultimately happened, the banks were bailed out by the taxpayers. And that, that's what happens. When, some, when stuff like this in the economy fa starts falling apart, someone has to pay the bill. In 2008, it was the poor people who lost their homes. They paid the bill because their house they lost their houses. And the taxpayers paid the bill because they bailed out the banks. I am here to tell you right now, this better not happen again. I am not bailing out any more banks. If they did this again, this is on them. They need to bail out themselves. This is this is and this is why this crisis that we're sitting in right now today, this commercial real estate price crisis, is going to be even worse because it's all rich people. It's a rich person problem that they created themselves. Because poor people don't own commercial real estate. Poor people owned these houses in 2008, but that's not what's happening now. Rich people own those buildings, so it's the rich people who are going to default. No poor taxpayers should be bailing this out. This is a rich person problem. So it's just like, it's like musical chairs. You know, I think everyone right now is kind of like holding their breath, seeing like what's going to happen. Like all these commercial buildings are going under. Who's going to pay the bill? And as soon as the music stops, someone's going to be left with the bill. Okay, so the main question is, who holds commercial real estate? And one name comes to mind for me. It's a BlackRock. Do you guys know about BlackRock? One of the biggest asset holders in the world, BlackRock's real estate business managed $28 billion in assets as of December 1st, 2023. So... BlackRock's just one, one of these major investment funds, but you know, these commercial buildings are owned by these like massive investment funds. So these are the guys who are going to be left holding the bag. And I am telling you, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. They better not use taxpayer dollars to bail out BlackRock. That would be evil. Okay. BlackRock does not deserve any of my money. And if BlackRock sounds familiar, it's probably over the ESG scandal. And I have the second bullet point here. This also is happening right now to BlackRock. March 2024, last month, the Texas State Board of Education notified BlackRock they would terminate the firm's management of $8.5 billion in assets over ESG. Now, we're not going to cover the whole ESG scandal here, but BlackRock is the main fund that's been pushing ESG policies on companies and ESG policies are basically Democrat political policies that BlackRock is saying you have to adopt these Democrat policies in your company to get our funding. And it's horrible that BlackRock is using Texas State Board of Education money to push Democrat policies on companies like it's so crooked. So anyway, BlackRock's in a horrible position because they're losing money over this ESG scandal. At, at the same time, they're losing money over real estate. What is BlackRock going to do? 
I don't know, but they better not take my taxpayer dollars. That's what I know. All right. So, is there a problem? The government says no. Isn't that interesting? The government says there's not a problem. So this is a photo of Janet Yellen. She's the U.S. Je Treasury Secretary, and she recently gave a uh, testimony in front of Congress, and they asked her, what's going on with this real estate stuff? We he we're hearing these whispers of this real estate disaster on the horizon. Is this a problem? And so her response was she said she is concerned. She's concerned about commercial real estate, but believes the situation is under control. She says it's manageable by government regulators. Government regulators is going to save the day. Now, am I the only person who thinks this is a load of, I can't, I can't say it on a live stream. <laughs> you know what I want to say though. This is a, 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 a lot of nonsense. This is a lot of nonsense. When was the last time the government fixed anything? The government is going to fix this commercial real estate crisis? Give me a break. So, but, okay, but I gotta say, it, like, my concern here is not just, not just a general concern over the mismanagement of government to fix things. My concern here is that the government has been lying to you. They've been lying to you specifically about the economy. Wait till you guys see this. This is a list. This is a table of the last 13 job reports. So you know how every month they, they re the government releases a report that says how many jobs were created. This is a list. What's been happening is that 11 of the last 13 jobs reports have been revised down. So this is what they'll do. In this first column here, this is the first number that they'll release with the initial reading of how many jobs were created. Then a month later, they'll do a first revision and they'll revise the numbers down. And then they'll do a second revision and revise the numbers down even further. And so this is the difference of how much they're lying about how many jobs are being created. I don't remember this ever happening before. I usually, I mean, usually there, there might be some revisions here or there, but never this bad. 11 of the last 13 jobs reports being revised down. This is horrible. They are going there and they're releasing these reports and saying, oh, the economy is so great. The economy is doing so well. And it's a lie. They're lying to you and they're doing it over and over and over again. That's why you might be reading these headlines that I, I've read the headlines. They, they're saying that Bidenomics is working and the economy is doing great and all these jobs are being created. No, they're not. They're not because the job reports are all being revised down by a lot. What, look at this. This is a chart showing the difference from that table. Okay, so this top line here, this is what they're reporting of jobs being created. If you chart out the revisions, this is what's actually happening. Can you believe this? This is how much the government is lying to us. And this is what this is why if it feels if it feels to you like the economy is doing horrible, that's because this is reality. The economy is doing horrible. They're lying to you. This is the difference. And this should shock you. It shocks me. All right. So what's going to happen? Is the stock market going to crash? That's the question that everybody, I mean, that's the million dollar question right there, right? So what are some things that you would look at to figure that out? Well, I look at economic indicators. So you try to figure out uh, what are some things that would tell us that bad times are ahead. They call these leading indicators. Um, so some things that I look at, I look at advertising and I look at travel. Because if you're the CEO 
of a company and you, let's say you're the CEO and you start seeing your revenues drop. Well, what are the first two things you're going to cut? You're going to cut advertising, you're going to cut travel because they're really easy things. They're, they can just, they're things that you can cut temporarily and turn them off and then turn them back on later. So there's some of the first things that businesses cut. Well, when every business across America cuts advertising and travel at the same time, that's when you have a recession. That's what you're worried about happening. So let's look at some metrics that show us what's happening with advertising and travel. Oh, by the way, I remember 2008. And this happened in 2008, right before the, cra right before the stock market crashed in 2008. If you were paying attention, you would notice that advertising and travel dropped. Companies, st companies started cutting back before the bad news actually hit. So this is kind of, I mean, I remember this happening in 2008. And so the idea is, can we see this happening again? So looking at advertising, this is one metric we can look at. This is average Facebook cost per click. So Facebook is one of the biggest advertising platforms in the world. So this is a kind of a good indicator of what's happening with advertising, our company's spending, because this is large, cost per click is largely driven by supply and demand. If more and more companies are wanting to advertise more, cost, and click, cost per click is going to be higher. If there's not as much demand for those at that ad space, cost per click, click blah, 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 sorry, is going to go down. So this is a chart from January 2020 to April 2024. And you can kind of see, it's hard to see the divisions here for the years, but it always spikes up during Christmas ad spend because companies want to sp ad spend during Christmas. So you can see this is Christmas 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, and we're at the beginning of 2024 over here, right? So you can see this trend downward in advertising. Companies are spending less. There's less of a demand for advertising. So remember, 2020 over here, right above my head, I'll have to duck down a little bit, but you can see this was during the pandemic, remember? Well, there was a lot of money flowing around during the pandemic because of all the government incentives out there. So companies were still advertising during the pandemic. So, you know, you can see average cost per click was like around $1 up here during the pandemic. Then the next year, it's around $1. And then... In this is 2020, 2021, this 2022 is when things start drip, dropping down and they keep dropping down. And then here we are down over here. And you can see that we're currently at 0.554 cost per click. So like around 50 cents. That's half of what it was in 2020 when it was around $1. Half, it's dropped by half. That's huge. So companies are spending less on advertising. Let's look at travel. The most important uh, metric, financial metric for hotel companies is something called RevPAR. This is revenue per available room. And this is from a report issued by S&P Global Ratings, one of the largest ratings agencies in the world. They recently, I think they released this last month, uh, this report, and they said that U.S. lodging sector RevPAR growth will moderate in 2024. So they've noticed RevPAR is decreasing. RevPAR would decrease if people are traveling less. Uh, the, the other quote here is they said it's likely, grow, likely growth of RevPAR is going to be 2 to 4% in 2024 compared to growth of around 5% in 2023. That's like, that's like half. That's like a half. It's going to be half the growth of it was in 2023. That's a huge negative change and matches what we see here. So that's another trouble, trouble sign of what's going on in travel. Here's something else we can look at. Uh, this is hospitality and tourism job posting on, postings on Indeed in the U.S., so Indeed, I'm sure you guys are aware, is a, uh, a, job, a job website where you post your resume. Uh, hotel companies use this a lot. So they'll post uh, you know, local jobs on Indeed. And so this shows how many job postings there are. So 
uh, over here, this is from 2020 to today. And so obviously during the pandemic, no one was posting jobs. So there's a huge dip down. Then after the pandemic, it went up. But you start noticing the same thing again. From 2022 through to today, it's this downward trend of job postings. No one, people are posting fewer and fewer jobs. And here's the deal in the hotel business or the travel business. If people are traveling, they're going to hire more people. If no one's traveling, they're not going to hire anybody. So this is a really bad sign. It's like all these charts are showing the same thing. It, everything's heading in a really bad direction. So the question is, if there's a stock market crash, when would it happen? And here's what I think. I think that these, all these charts are showing that companies are, are making less revenue. And that's going to show up within the next two quarters, the next quarter or the next the, the quarter after that. Those quarters are going to be announced. If they come out less than what people are expecting, stocks are going to drop. So revenue drops over the next two quarters could put downward pressure on the stock market. That would be right before the election in November. This could all be happening right at the same time. I really think there's going to be some, some kind of movement in market before the November election. I mean, that's the next two quarters right there. We're talking about a potential 2008-style collapse. So if you remember what happened in 2008, I mean, this is a lot of the same things we're seeing happen again. Could you imagine the 2008 collapse happening again? Now, again, I just to be fair, Janet Yellen of the government says, you don't have to worry. We got everything under control. But you have to weigh that with, do we believe the government who is lying to us? <laughs> I'm a little skeptical. So let's put on our conspiracy theory hat for a moment. <laughs> if I was going to put on my tinfoil hat, I would say I think there's some people out there who are motivated to make this crash happen before the election. Because think about this. If there's a uniparty in control, and Joe Biden is the uniparty guy, obviously, all right? They, the uniparty is, Joe's under their control and Donald Trump is kind of anti-establishment, okay? I think everyone agrees with that. Well, if a crash was gonna happen, I would think the uniparty would want to force it to happen before the election because there's so much uncertainty around what's gonna happen during the election. There's, there's, no one knows what's gonna happen. So if, if a crash is gonna happen, the uniparty would prefer it to happen before the election because they know Joe Biden is in control and they can influence Joe Biden to do a bailout or whatever they wanna do to respond to that crisis. You know, if, if Joe Biden ends up not being there after the election, who knows what's gonna happen? So I do think there's a, a group of people out there who will be motivated to force a crash to happen before the November election. Now, you know, we can't say that for sure, but you know, there's always going to be people out there with different motivations trying to do different things. So just something to keep in mind about, about the timing of when something like this could happen. Um, I think it's all, it's all connected. <laughs> to the election. All right, so let's do some questions. How can you prepare? What are you going to do? I probably scared you a lot during this live stream. Again, like I said at the beginning, I'm not giving any financial advice here, but you know, we can all agree there's some base, basic, you know, financial principles that you can follow. Make smart financial choices, make less risky investments, have an emergency fund, try to have some savings handy, and just think, you know, what did you do back in 2008? When the collapse happened in 2008 and the global economy almost fell apart, what did you do to survive it? And if you had to go through that again, what would you do to prepare for that? 
Um, I would, you know, I would just say just a, a word of advice. If you're thinking about different financial options between now and the election, I might err on the side of choosing a less risky option and going with a more conservative approach on things. I don't know. Just, just some food for thought of ways that you can be prepared. All right. So that is kind of it. That's kind of a summary of what I wanted to talk about. Just want to say thank you so much for everybody who's been here. Um, want to give you a couple of updates. I have really, really exciting news. Um, the, I, the website, wolvesandfinance.com, is getting a complete overhaul. So there's going to be a new website. I'm trying to get it released this month. So hopefully it'll be coming out this month. We will see, but stay tuned for that. Um, again, you know, that's where you sign up for a membership. If you want to become a member of the channel, uh, you go to the website and then members get an exclusive access, uh, only access to certain features on the website. That's all going to be revamped for members. So it's going to be very, very cool. Stay tuned for that. Of course, I got to mention the best way to support this channel uh, is to sign up for a membership. You can sign up for a $6 a month monthly membership on the website, wolvesandfinance.com. That helps me to keep putting out these videos. You know, I come on here, I try to give you the most up-to-date information and I speak the truth and I get in trouble for doing that. So I, a lot of time, a lot of my videos get demonetized. I get shadow banned. People are telling me all the time they can't get notifications from my videos or they're getting unsubscribed. Like weird shadow ban stuff is happening to me. So the way that I survive is through your guys' membership. So thank you to everybody who's a member. I appreciate you guys so much. If you ever have any questions for me or anything, you can always email me. My email is on the website. You can go check it out. Um, hey, we got a super chat. From Michael Gunther, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Thank you for stopping by the live stream. Um, got to say also, new video this Sunday. Uh, so you got two shows this week. You got this live stream, and then well, I'll have my usual video on Sunday. I always post a video on Sundays. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be a good one. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I have been like checking up on your chats. Thank you guys so much. I see all of your guys' chats saying thank you. Appreciate your work. I appreciate all of you guys. And um, again, even, even if I miss a chat, I go back through and I read all of your chats after the stream. So I catch everybody what you guys are saying. So I appreciate you guys so much. All right, that's gonna be it for me, everybody. Stay safe out there, and I will see you in the next video. Bye.